Hi friends, welcome to EPG Parshala project. Here, I am Dr. Bindu B, Assistant Professor, Mar Theophilus Training College, Thiruvananthapuram, Kerala. Today, we are going to discuss about the economic perspectives of education. Let me start the module on market economy and education in India. Let us have a look into the main objectives of this module. First, to explain the concept of market economy. Second, to analyze the pros and cons of market economy. Third, to explain the impact of market economy on education. Fourth, to gain insight into the education system followed in India. Everybody knows what an economy is and the different type of economies. In economics, we often come across the term market economy. It is useful in this context to have an analysis of what a market is. To a common man, market is a place where things are bought and sold. What is the principle behind buying and selling of goods? If we analyze how the system works, we can understand that things are bought and sold according to the principle of demand and supply. So, demand and supply conditions are essential in a market. Just like this, a market economy works. Market economy is an economy in which decisions regarding investment, production and distribution are based on market determined demand and supply and prices of goods and services are determined in a free price system. Certain features may be distinguishing the market economy from that of a centrally planned economy. Now, we will move on to a peculiar features that makes a market economy. A market economy is defined by six characteristics. First one is that of private property. Most goods and services are privately owned. This allows the owners to make legally binding contracts to buy, sell, lease or rent their property. In other words, their property gives them the right to profit from ownership. However, there are exclusions to what is considered private property. For example, since 1865, the US does not allow you to buy and sell other people or even yourself. This includes your own body or body parts. Second comes the freedom of choice. Owners, businesses, consumers and workers are free to produce, sell and purchase goods and services in a free market. Their only constraint is the price they are willing to buy or sell for and the amount of capital they have. Third one is the motive of self-interest. The market is driven by everyone trying to sell their goods or services to the highest bidder, while at the same time paying the least for the goods and services they need. Although the motive is selfish, it works to the benefit of the economy over the long run. That's because this auction system fits prices of all goods and services accurately depicting true supply and demand at any given point in time. Fourth one is the case of competition. The forces of competitive pressure keeps prices moderate and ensure that goods and services are provided most efficiently. That is because as soon as demand increases for a particular item, prices rise thanks to the law of demand. As competitors see there is additional profit to be made, they start production, adding to supply. This lowers prices to a level where only the best competitors remain. This force of competitive pressure also applies to workers who are competing with each other for the highest paying jobs and consumers who are competing for the best product at the lowest price. Then comes the system of market and prices. That is, 
A market economy is completely dependent on an efficient market in which to sell goods and services. In an efficient market, all buyers and sellers have equal assets and the same information upon which to base their decisions. Prices rise and fall freely depending purely on the laws of demand and supply. Sixth one is the limited government interferences. The role of government is simply to ensure that the markets are open and working. For example, it is in charge of national defense, so no other country can destroy the markets. It also makes sure that everyone does have equal access to the markets. For example, government exerts penalties on monopolies which unfairly restrict competition. The government watches to make sure no one is unfairly manipulating those markets and that all information is distributed equally. There can be pros and cons for such a system. What will be the advantages of the market economy? Let us see the advantages of market economy. That is, since a market economy allows the free interplay of supply and demand, it also ensures the most desired goods and services are produced. That is because consumers are willing to pay the highest price for the things they want the most. Business will only produce those things that return a profit. Goods and services are produced in the most efficient way possible. The most efficient producers will receive more profit than less efficient ones. Innovation is rewarded. Producers who are innovative will come up with a more efficient method of production. Innovation of new products will meet the needs of consumers in better ways that existing goods and services. This innovation will spread to other competitors so they too can be more profitable. The business and individuals who are most efficient and innovative will accumulate more capital. They can invest this in other efficient and innovative companies giving them a leg up and leading to an overall higher quality of production. The system of market economy has certain disadvantages also. Just have a look into this. That is, a market economy functions through competition. However, there are many people in a society who are at a natural competitive disadvantage, such as the elderly, children and mentally or physically challenged people. In addition to the caretakers of those people are also at a disadvantage because the energies and skills are taken up with the creating and not competing. Thus, a society based on pure market economy must decide whether it is in larger self-interest to set aside resources to make sure that they get their needs met or whether to let them just fall by the wayside. A market economy rewards who are good at being competitive. Therefore, the society reflects the values of those people and organizations. This explains why a market economy may produce private jets for some while others starve and are homeless. Now, moving on to the education in a market economy. Just see how it functions. The value of education has been recognized from the ancient time onwards. The educated class was looked upon as an elite class. The economic conditions over the world are changing so fast and these changes have its reflection on the education system also. A paradigm shift is taking place all over the world with regard to the concept of providing education. Considering education from the economic point of view leads to the same question that is the basic economic problem. That is what to produce, how to produce, for whom to produce. Viewing education as a productive system may give answer to this. In economics, educational programs and institutions 
can be viewed as a productive system. What is a productive system? A productive system may be defined as an integrated and interrelated set of components directed the production of some commodity or commodities. Educational system can be definitely called as a productive system in the real sense because it produces output especially various forms of learning. The key components of a system includes inputs, processes and output. Let us check one by one. First, the inputs which comprises the resources required to enable the system to operate such as first one is the real resources that includes teachers and ancillary staff, students, equipment and consumable materials, building and land, then finance is there, time that is it represents the salary of one teacher for a fixed set period of time, then there is the information that is relevant information required for an administrator and other intangible resources such as goodwill and credibility. The second aspect is the process which describes the way in which resources are combined in the system to produce the result. This is embodied in the curriculum of the school or college in the educational methodologies it employs and in the ways in which it is structured and managed. The third aspect is the output which are likely to be expressed in terms of learning which may be changes in knowledge, skills and attitude of individuals as a result of their experience within the educational system. Moreover, there are outputs which may be production of knowledge as a result of research in higher education. The next question is how to produce? This point to the fact which option of production process must be selected. Education is considered as a tool for development in a welfare state. Prime importance is given to the upliftment and empowerment value of education in the society. In such cases, the responsibility falls on the government without considering the cost involved for the program. The final question is, for whom it should be produced? Who should pay for it? The recent trend in economic changes accept a wave of transition even in developing countries along with the highly developed nations. The transition is from a development paradigm that predominantly based on Keynesianism to a neoliberal paradigm. The key position is now being held by the markets. It is claimed increasingly nowadays that it is not the government but the market that can do everything for everybody. This philosophy had come into the education sector as well, more intensely the higher education sector. World Bank in its report has made it clear that the role of the state in education should be reduced more explicitly higher education is promoted as an economically and educationally efficient proposal and it is argued that the role of government should be confined broadly to the formulation of a coherent policy framework. Are you familiar with the latest trend in business world? Does it have any impact on the education sector? Yes, market philosophy is slowly diffused into the education sector evoking tensions and conflict from several corners of the globe. Privatization is being pursued in higher education as a very effective measure of improving efficiency and as an important measure of easing financial crisis. Nowadays, higher education in many countries are on the crossroads. Higher education has been valued by the society much in extra years owing to the social, economic, cultural functions associated with it. Have a glance at these values. That is, knowledge was considered as a sort of wealth, then again an instrument for personal development, a means for empowerment and enhancement of living conditions, a tool 
for societal development and to uphold the values of the society. Development of human capital and a way to economic growth. The public good concept was given the importance and there was a clear line of demarcation from the commercial and business organization as it had no concern for profit motive. Now, with the unveiling of the economic reform policies, the role of higher education is reinterpreted and redefined. The market promoting strategies everywhere create serious challenge to higher education. Just look into the changing situation. New values, policies and practices replace the traditional and well established values, concepts and approaches. Social democratic visions are being replaced by market driven policies. Marketization has become the buzzword. The role of the government is being reinvested. The traditional functions of production and dissemination of knowledge are under attack. Public subsidization of higher education is being increasingly criticized. Equity in higher education is no more cared. The modern economic policies or simply called the market reforms that aim at making higher education institution responsive to market forces do not distinguish between education and any commercial product. Under market economy, education is also undergoing process of marketization and privatization in terms of orientation, provision, curriculum and financing. The new system treats education as a huge market where schools are the employers and teachers are traded based on their education background and teaching experience. The system was meant to create competition under the premise that only the fittest will survive which places the stakeholders in susceptible conditions. The features of education under market economy are that is the rise of private or non-government schools, funding from non-state sectors, increasing number of self-paying students, then there is the market driven curricula. In this process education has adapted the fee paying principle, it has reduced state provision and has been driven by revenue generating courses and programs. As such, education has become a commodity and schools are run like businesses. The user pays principle and the rise of non-state provision suggests a withdrawal of the state from provision and subsidy of public education. The basic principle of demand and supply is applicable in education sector also. What do you mean by demand for education? How can the demand for education be increased? What are the factors that cause an increase in demand for education? Let us look into the concept of demand versus supply. The demand for education can be defined as the desire of an individual or group of persons for a particular type or level of education at any particular point in time. Where private education is concerned, the demand for education therefore refers to the total number of people who desire a given type or level of education are willing to pay the cost of getting it and are capable of acquiring it. In places where education is comprised of a mix of public and private schools, two type of demand arises. That is, the demand by those who can afford to pay for their education are willing to pay for it and are capable of acquiring such education that is private demand. And second one is the demand by those who cannot afford to pay for their education but are capable of acquiring such education if granted public sponsorship that is social demand. The former can be referred to as private demand for education while the latter refers to social demand for education or the willingness of a community or society to fund the education of its citizens. 
it is for this reason that it has become common to regard private demand for education as investment demand and the social demand for education as consumption demand. Supply like demand is a flow, it is so much amount per day, per week or per year. Manpower supply will likewise be the number of persons available during a period of time to perform the jobs newly offered plus the jobs already existing. The long term trend is for education to claim a rising percentage of national income. Looking at the past, in the rise in the share of education in national income in the early decades of this country was due to legislation for universal primary education. Later on, legislation raising the minimum school living age that is we know 6 to 14 years caused increase in enrollment in compulsory education. Consequent on legislation, there has been a great increase in enrollment in voluntary education in recent years. Such increase in enrollment in voluntary education at the second and third levels of education that is secondary and college levels is due to the educational aspirations of the young in recent years and also due to the higher status and emoluments that higher education promises to the aspirants. The unit cost of third level education having increased considerably in recent years. Higher emolument in higher level education has led to a higher share of education in the national income. The demand theory in economics concern relationship between the amounts of various goods demanded on the other hand and the prices of goods and the income of consumers on the other side. Here also the phenomenon involved are quantifiable, but this theory is quite difficult to apply to education because all the phenomena connected to education etc like the prices, satisfaction are not quantifiable. They are extremely complex and present many problems. The following are some of the problems in formulating demand theory in education. First one, education is an effort embracing many different levels and involves a complex system of institutions. So, we cannot take the component parts or levels in the system separately and try to analyze the demand for education since there exist varying degrees of complementarity between the parts and levels. Second one, the demand for education has to be invariably analyzed in the long term framework because in education any analysis of demand must take into account the factors like changes in quality, taste, etc. Such changes do not take place during a short period and hence analysis of short term changes in demand for education will be an incomplete exercise. Usually demand for education is analyzed for 10 or 20 year periods. Third one. The problem of assessing the demand for education is a very difficult one of analyzing a complex set of institutions which comprises the educational system on the one hand and an even more complex set of institutions and values which is known as society on the other hand. In the other words, this relationship is the one between education and the economy. It is clear thus that the above relationship is not a functional relationship between the amount demanded and price, income or a rate of return on investment as in other sectors of the economy. Fourth one, the analysis of demand for education is further complicated by the fact that educational system and the society are in a constant state of flux and hence any analysis of demand for education must take into account this fact of constant change. Further, the relationship between education and society is not a one way relationship of income, price, etc. acting on the demand for education, but it is one of the interaction between education and society. This 
means that education may influence the society's demand for education. Thus, in dealing with the demand for education, the traditional price theory, which is basically static, is being attempted to be applied to the dynamic and complex social processes involved in education. So, we cannot expect too many results from such an analysis of the demand for education. From the above discussion, it becomes clear that the analysis of demand for education has to be based on a radically different framework which takes into account whether education is regarded as a consumption good or as an investment good. But it must be understood that it is difficult to categorize any education, any good consistently as consumption or investment good because the inclusion of particular goods or services in one category or the other is partially a matter of the use to which it is put and partially of the time dimension chosen rather than that of any inherent property of the good itself. On applying the above criteria to education, we find that education is both an investment and a consumption good. Education is an investment good because first it yields its benefit or is consumed over a long period of time and second it enables individuals who purchase it to derive a future stream of benefits from the jobs they may acquire and it enables a society to derive benefits in the form of goods and services which the educated labor force may add to the society. Education is a consumption good in so far as it is demanded for its own sake or in the sense that it is considered rewarding and intellectually stimulating in itself. Coming to the investment demand for education, we find that it has taken two forms namely private return to investment and social return to investment. The cost and benefit to individuals may be compared to give an estimation of the private returns to education and thus an estimation of the private investment demand for education. Second, the cost and benefits to society may be compared and the social rates of return may be calculated. The purpose of the calculation of private returns to education is to explain and predict the demand for education by private individuals. Social return calculations usually serve a normative purpose that is they are made in order to provide a criterion by which public policy towards education may be judged. Coming next to the consumption demand for education, we find that the social demand comes under this category. The concept of social demand for education is different from the investment demand concept. The social demand is difficult to interpret in terms of demand theory and is oriented towards consumption approach to education. The higher the income per head, the greater will be the demand for second and third level education. The aspect of social demand for education helps in making forecast of enrollment trends that is in planning. In social demand it is generally assumed that price changes will most affect demand for education. Social demand forecast often takes into major educational policy changes whose primary effect is to alter the whole institutional and legal framework within which education is provided. Such policy changes are notably changes in the legal minimum school living age, the provision of new types of institution or changes in the admission standards of various institutions. Thus, the concept of social demand for education is a loose one and such important elements in demand analysis as prices and incomes are kept very much in the background. Social demand is not generally related to manpower needs, though the fact is that a good part of second and third level education is vocational in orientation. It assumes that Students will look carefully at the labor market before making educational decisions and that these decisions will ultimately satisfy the manpower needs of the nation. But the fact remains that 
labor market is not an efficient instrument for meeting varied manpower needs. So, social demand is inadequate for securing the required varieties of manpower. Therefore, to obtain adequate manpower, it may be necessary to supplement social demand forecast with manpower and economic growth forecast. A large proportion of third level education is related to providing technical, scientific and other forms of specialist manpower. Consequently, the using of social demand as a policy aim is unsatisfactory in the absence of perfect market for labor and education. So, the social demand approach of planning education is often subjected to manpower planning and investment return analysis. Then comes the supply of education. The assumption that expenditure on the development of human capital will give rise to additional national income is borne out by facts. It is seen that positive correlation between education and income in more than 30 countries. What is important to employers about education is not so much that it provides technical training as that it socializes for desire and efficient adaptation to work in bureaucratic and industrial hierarchies. The contribution of education to productivity is only indirect. Let us sum up the demand and supply principle in education. It is useful in this context to know how the system works in our economy. As we all know, the economy of India is the seventh largest in the world by nominal GDP and the third largest by purchasing power parity, which is denoted as PPP. The country is classified as a newly industrialized country and a developing economy with an average growth rate of approximately 7 percent over the last two decades. India has one of the fastest growing service sector in the world with annual growth rate of above 9 percent since 2001, which contributed to 57 percent of GDP in 2012-13. India has capitalized its economy based on its large educated English speaking population to become a major export of IT services, BPO services and software services with 167 billion US dollars worth of service export in 2013-14. It is also the fastest growing part of the economy. The IT industry continues to be the largest private sector employer in India. Then let us look into a impact of market economy upon Indian education system that is private investment was mobilized in educational sector. Irregularities in education was wiped out. Our economy is a mid-set economy where there exists both public and private partnership to suit the varying needs of educated development is huge population. Government investment in education is mobilized that means for public welfare. Irregular profit motive of private sector were wiped out through active government interferences and control. Resource allocation in educational development is mobilized. To conclude, India is a mid-set economy with huge population facing disparity in many aspects. For such a society to make progress on democratic principles, education act as the key instrument. Governmental support is highly essential for large section of masses of in the country. Hence, a judicious blending of policies is needed for the country in its march towards progress. Be a part of this movement. Thank you.